Okay, students, we have a Unit 9 test coming up on Monday, and it is covering uh, mostly the information about solids that we have been doing for the last couple of weeks, plus a little bit of extra information that we have seen uh, just here at the end. So let's do a little bit of a review. Uh, so hopefully you can be as ready as possible for Monday. Okay, now obviously the bulk of the uh, information in this unit is on solids. So the very first thing that we did is we got a little bit of vocabulary going, and we uh, came up with a definition for the term solid, and a solid describes the entire family of three-dimensional shapes. So just like the term polygon kind of defined the vast majority of the shapes, uh, two-dimensional shapes, the term solid defines the vast majority of three-dimensional shapes. Okay, now some of the more specific terms, of course, our three-dimensional solids are built out of two-dimensional polygons, and those two-dimensional polygons are called the faces of the solid. Now, if you count up all of the uh, sides of your solid, uh, those are the total number of faces, but the number of faces can be broken down into two smaller categories, which are the bases and the lateral faces. Now, we've talked a little bit about, uh, or a pretty good amount about the bases. Uh, there can be two bases to a figure. There can be one base to a figure. And some of the figures that we've seen do not have any bases at all. Uh, the key is to identify the bases of the figure. And then once you have identified the bases, then everything that is not a base is a lateral face. Okay, so uh, when the... Uh, faces of the solid join together, line segments are formed, and those line segments are called edges of the poly or edges of the solid. And where the edges join together, a point is formed, and the point is called a vertex of the solid. Okay. We also talked about a formula that mathematically connects the number of faces to the number of edges to the number of uh, vertices, and that is called Euler's formula. It is going to be a formula that you're going to need to have memorized coming into the test. They uh, can uh, question you on this, and they will expect you to know it. And the formula states that the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces always equals 2 in any solid. Okay, now we came up with an interesting little uh, vocabulary catch here. If your figure only has one base, okay, in the, uh, the idea of a pyramid or a cone, okay, uh, if you only have one base, then across from that base is going to be a single point where a bunch of lateral faces or a single lateral face kind of converges upon itself. Okay, so the figure kind of just tapers away and becomes a pointed end. When this happens, that particular location is referred to as the, the vertex of the solid. Now, it's not to be confused with the other uh, vertices of the solid. Okay, every corner point on your solid is a vertex, and if you add them up, you have a total number of vertices vertices. However, there is only one location in the figure that may be called the vertex. Okay, so uh, make sure you, you have a clear understanding of the difference between the number of vertices and the location of the vertex. All right, uh, if you do not have a position in your figure that can be called the vertex, meaning the figure does not uh, taper away into a single point in a particular location, then chances are you're looking at a figure that has two bases rather than one base. And you can confirm this suspicion by looking at uh, the nature of those two bases. They will always be across from each other. They will always be parallel to each other, and they will always be congruent to each other. So uh, most of your solids, you ought to be able to break them down into those two categories. Either we can find the vertex or we can find two parallel congruent uh, shapes across from each other in the figure. All right, uh, we did say that we may have uh, no bases at all, okay, in which case it is a sphere or spherical, spheroid type objects. Uh, we did not get into those uh, really much at all, just introduced their presence, and then that was kind of it. 
Now, a couple of measurements that are in the figures that we need to know is, of course, the height. And as always in geometry, height does not have anything to do with how tall something is. Height is always measured perpendicular to your bases. Okay, so if you have one base, like in the case of the pyramid up top, then the base, uh, the height measures perpendicular away from that base up to, uh, across to the vertex. Or in the case of a uh, figure that has two bases, then we're still measuring perpendicular, but it'll actually be perpendicular to both bases. That's just the way height works. Another measurement that we came across, which has been important in some of our calculations, has been the idea of slant height. Now, slant height is not interested in being perpendicular to the base itself, but it is perpendicular to the edge of the base. And the only way that that can happen is for this measurement to run up one of the lateral faces uh, to the vertex. Slant height only occurs in figures that only have one base. Okay, so that was that. The next day we came back and we looked at particular types of solids, got a naming system going uh, as well as that. Okay, and what we learned was that the figures that have two bases uh, are referred to as the family of prisms. Okay, and further, our prisms are named according to what type of a shape our uh, base is. So we have triangular prisms and rectangular prisms and pentagonal prisms and hexagonal prisms and stuff like that, just depending on what shape the base is. Okay. If our prism happens to have circular bases, we don't technically call it a prism anymore. It is a prism, but we call it a cylinder is the more specific name. And if we happen to have a rectangular prism that has all of its faces being squares, we don't call it a rectangular prism anymore. More specifically, we call it a cube. Now, if our figure only has one base, this is the family of pyramids. Okay, and once again, the pyramids are named also according to what kind of a shape their base is. Okay, so we have triangular pyramids, rectangular pyramids, hexagonal pyramids, and so on. If our uh, shape of our base for our pyramids happens to be a circle, sure, it is still a pyramid, but more specifically, we call it a cone. And of course, if our figure doesn't have any uh, bases at all, probably it's a sphere. But as you probably suspect already, uh, there are spherical type objects that are not perfectly round. Okay, they're called spheroids, but we haven't really gotten into that at all. Okay, so we just kind of introduced the idea of a sphere and left it at that. Okay, so that was the end of that lesson. Okay, so after all of the vocabulary was done, we got into some of the mathematics dealing with our solids. And the first calculation we looked at was surface area. Okay, now surface area, the technical definition that I gave you, is the amount of stuff required to uh, cover a solid. Okay, now um, in this aspect, what I always tend to think about is like a, a present. If you're having trouble remembering the difference between surface area and volume, which I, th I think most people have got it down, but remember surface area is the wrapping paper around the present. Volume would be the present itself. Okay, now um, I'm actually on the wrong lesson here. I've got them in, in backwards order. Uh, the first one that we did was prisms. We're looking at the pyramids right now. Uh, pyramids had a formula that went along with them. The formula was one half times the perimeter of the base times the slant height plus the area of the base. Okay. Now, this has actually been simplified a little bit for us because uh, all the pyramids that we have seen have been regular polygons on their bases. Uh, so we haven't had to worry about really any, any crazy shapes going on with our bases. And I have no reason to suspect that the test will be different. Uh, any surface area calculation should have a regular base on your pyramid. 
Okay, so basically this was a step-by-step -step process walking through simply plugging numbers into the formulas and in some cases you might have been missing some information to plug into the formula, but in which case we employ uh, much the same strategies that we've been using all along. Let's build a right triangle, allow that right triangle to attach itself to whatever measurement it is that we're missing, and then you can use things like Pythagorean theorem to find a missing side length or SOHCAHTOA to find a missing side length or maybe even the 30, 60, 90 or 45, 45, 90 rules to find your missing side length. You can plug in your information and you're pretty much good to go. Okay, now here's the surface area that I missed a moment ago or the uh, prisms. Okay, there was the definition, the amount of stuff required to cover a solid. Uh, the strategy on this one is a little bit harder. Okay, true enough, uh, you can't, there are a few formulas that do exist for surface area, but they change pretty radically according to what kind of a shape that we actually have, uh, what type of a solid we actually have. So I kind of gave you just an all-encompassing uh, strategy, which is to look at the net of the figure. And of course, a net is the, uh, the term that describes if you take a three-dimensional solid and you allow it to break apart at the edges and allow all of the faces to kind of collapse down onto a flat surface so that we can see them all uh, side by side on a two-dimensional surface rather than a three-dimensional drawing. That is what we call a net. Then we can transfer the information, uh, the measurement information from the solid that we had to the net that we now have. And then using that information, we probably ought to be able to figure out the areas of all of the different uh, polygons that are in the net. And as we saw, uh, some of the areas end up being redundant. We see the same area in more than one place. You can find all six different areas if you want, but if you're paying attention, you might realize that, hey, some of these areas are, are repeated, so you can find them once and uh, simply multiply by how many times you have that area, and then you add them all up, okay? Uh, the only other one I want to take a look at is, of course, um, where is it? There it is, the cylinder. Okay. Some people still have a little bit of trouble uh, envisioning the net of a cylinder. Remember, when you take a cylinder and you break it apart, it is its edges. Okay, The two circular bases can pop off of the top and the bottom of the cylinder rather easily, but what about the lateral face? Well, we kind of have to cut it open and unfold it, and when you do that, you end up with a rectangle. So the net of a cylinder is two circles and a rectangle, and remember that the length or width or whatever you want to call it of this rectangle is exactly long enough to reach around the circular base exactly one time. So that would be equal to the circumference of the circular base. So if you have to do that calculation, remember that it's going to be 2 pi r for the circumference of the circle to match this length of this rectangle. Okay, the next calculation that we got into was dealing with the three-dimensional part of the solids, which is, of course, the volume. Now we're not looking at the, the wrapping paper on the package. Now we're looking at the package itself. Okay, so volume is the amount of stuff required to fill our solid. And these guys, when you're dealing with a prism, Okay, we have a formula. Volume equals big B, little h. Big B represents the area of the uh, shape that is the base of our prism and then multiplied by the height of the prism itself. Now, this is very important on your prism. You better be able to identify which side is your base because if you get this one wrong, it may very well uh, bring you to an incorrect answer for your volume. Okay, so area of your base times your height. So figure out which side is your base, find its area, and then multiply by the height of the prism. The rest of the lesson was just examples. Okay, the next day we went on and looked at the figures that only have one base, the pyramids. Okay, so we, once again we have a formula. It's very similar to the formula for prisms. Okay, only if you only have one base, we end up with exactly one third of that formula. So our formula is one third times the area of the base times the height. Now in a pyramid, it is almost impossible 
uh, get the base incorrect, we ought to be able to identify which side it is uh, with pretty much 100% accuracy. Let's find the area of that base and then multiply by the height of the pyramid. Now be careful, this is the actual height of the pyramid, not the slant height. So if you're having trouble between the definitions between height and slant height, you probably need to go back to your vocabulary and look that up. Okay, once again, the rest of this lesson was pretty much examples. Okay, the last two pieces of information that we've been dealing with with solids has been the idea of taking a solid and chopping it into pieces, and then also the idea of taking a solid and building it into bigger pieces with other solids. Okay, so cross sections is the idea of chopping a solid up into pieces, and more specifically, it is the, the concept of chopping the solid into two pieces, but then examining the type of surface that would be exposed by the fact that the figure has been chopped into two pieces. Okay, so we, we looked at some examples on things like, uh, like cross-sections, uh, how cutting uh, a figure up in various uh, directions or various angles in those directions could actually cause different shapes uh, to appear by the cross-section. And we have seen, uh, or we did see several examples of how uh, different shapes uh, might be showing up. And as I did express to you in class, that this has kind of been the way that tests have been uh, evolving towards. There have been questions that have been showing up in recent years asking about what are the possible shapes that could be generated by cross-secting a solid. So if we do run into questions like that, we're probably going to have to stop and spend a little brain time uh, worrying about uh, or thinking about what type of shapes could be created. Now I gave you this assignment, which I fear many of you did not do, because uh, unfortunately if I don't put it down on a piece of paper and make you turn it in for a grade, then a lot of you think, oh well, it wasn't for a grade, then I'm just not going to do it. Well, you're going to get a grade on it. It's going to come in the form of questions on the test. Okay, so if you did not uh, ever find time as you were instructed to go to these websites and uh, expose yourself to a little bit of the cross-section uh, information, then you can probably uh, count on the fact that you are not going to get those questions right if they show up on the test. So it's not too late. You got until Monday. Uh, find some time. Go to these websites and play around with the applets that are on there and see if you can gain a little perspective into what cross-sections uh, can do. Now these links are provided for you on Edmodo back on the day when we did cross-sections. The last thing we've gotten into is perspectives, and this is kind of the idea of uh, composite solids. Uh, we have solids that are stuck together, and what do they look like on uh, from different perspectives, different directions, and then of course more recently, uh, what happens with their volume and their surface area when the figures are joined together. Okay, so first things first, perspective. We've been seeing a bunch of questions uh, for a lot of years on perspective, and that is basically uh, dealing with the idea that three-dimensional figures obviously look different when you look at them from different angles. Okay, so I exposed you to uh, what is called the the uh, top front left view. Okay, or front top left view, whatever order they choose to put it in. But in short, basically it means that we typically can see the front of the figure, we can see the top of the figure, and we can see the left of the figure all in one view. And this is what is termed the isometric view. Iso meaning same, metric meaning measures. Okay, so we can see all of these measurements from one view. Okay, so questions have had a habit of here recently either providing with an uh, providing us with an isometric view, and then asking us what do the particular side views look like, which is the um, those are called orthographic, or providing us with the orthographic views, and then asking us about the isometric. Okay, so we spent a little bit of time uh, having a little bit of fun trying to draw some three-dimensional figures, which proved to be kind of funny for some of you. And then the orthographic views was the particular uh, information about what they looked like from different uh, perspectives. Okay, and then the final thing that we did was, of course, taking these uh, isometric figures, these composite solids, and then figuring out 
Uh, what is their surface area? Meaning, which of the faces are still exposed to the outside of the figure? And of course, keep in mind that even though our, our isometric uh, figure, our three-dimensional solid, is sitting on our desk like we, we saw with our cubes, remember that the bottom of that solid is still an exposed surface as far as the figure is concerned. It is only gravity that is holding it down to the desk that prevents us from being able to see it. But as far as the solid is concerned, it's still there. The only surfaces that are not still there are when we get one solid, uh, one cube uh, butting up to another cube, and as such, they kind of cancel out those sides that are that are caught in between them. Those are no longer on the outside of the figure. So for a calculation like surface area, we would not count those. But volume absolutely counts, because each one of those cubes, even though they're sitting side by side, each cube still has mass. So each cube, the more you put in there, the more volume you're going to get. And if they're kind enough to have the uh, edges of our cube, be one unit, kind of like we did with our activity in class, then the volume becomes very, very easy to calculate. Okay, but that's the way it works, and uh, that's pretty much what we did and what we are looking at as far as information coming into the next test. There's not a lot of calculation information in there. Sure, there's a lot of different questions they could ask us about surface area, a lot of different questions they could ask us about volume, but it's a very limited amount of information as far as how to do it. You've got three formulas, and you've got one method. That's not a lot of information as far as this whole unit is concerned. The rest of it is a ton of vocabulary and understanding. So if I were you, I'd spend a good amount of time studying, make sure I knew my terms and my definitions. I would look at the uh, websites on cross sections. I would make sure I could do the calculations uh, on perspectives with their surface area and their volumes and stuff like that. And I would, uh, I would definitely make sure that I know my formulas. Okay. Beyond that, it's probably all the information that you need. If you can come to class Monday with that, you're probably going to be in good shape. All right. Uh, appreciate you finding time to listen into the review, and I'll see you at the test.